This is the Tesla Power Podcast. This is where we're building the Tesla Energy community. We're covering solar panels, solar roof, and power wall for your home. I'm Aaron Brady, and today let's talk about Tesla Solar in Long Island. Let's talk about Indiana net metering. Talk about solar inverter trouble, getting the most out of your solar panels. And let's talk about VPP payments and a lot more. And as per usual, we'll kick off the podcast with community input. You can participate in a few ways. You can leave a comment below. You can link your YouTube videos. You can call 203-816-5150, or you can email teslapowerpodcast at gmail.com. And first up, we've got Rashidul Alam. He's considering Tesla Solar. Let's see what he's got to say. Quote, thinking of getting Tesla Solar for my house in Long Island, New York. Anyone have any experience with Tesla Solar in New York, New York City areas? How are Tesla here and their service installation time and services after install, end quote. And we had community member John Sella had some encouraging input, though tempered. Let's see what he had to say. I'm located in Orange County, New York. Their local installers are awesome. Their customer service, based in California, however, leaves a lot to be desired, end quote. Now, I can't speak for the Long Island team, but the Connecticut team was great. The people that work for Tesla, they're incredible people. I mean, they're great talents, tremendously dedicated, and they're super approachable. In fact, they love to talk, not just because they're the, you know, they're geeks for the work they do, but because they're passionate advocates for the work they do. Um, I don't know, it's a really unusual company with an unusually urgent mission, and the, you know, they tend to attract the really best, most passionate people to their workforce. So, you know, for the work, you can expect the very best. However, pre-sales you can expect a lot of lack of communication. And post-sales, you can expect the same lack of communication. I mean, I would definitely say communication is not Tesla's strong suit, uh, strong suit but, but this lack of communication is often translated as poor customer service. But this is a mistranslation. When you get a Tesla rep on the phone or on email or in person, they are awesome. Legitimately, they are excellent. But getting someone's attention can be a challenge. So I have a couple of pieces of advice. Number one, go with Tesla's suggested system configuration. Their, recommend, uh, their recommendation engine, uh, it's great. It basically nails your requirement. And I get it. You might not be able to afford their recommended system, but this leads to my second recommendation. Get as much storage as you can afford. Now, without storage, you can't use your system when the grid goes down. And without adequate storage, you can't back up your whole home and won't be able to make it through an extended grid down event without having to ration power. So at the bare minimum, in my opinion, you should have two power walls. And then my last recommendation, and probably the most important, do not change your order. If you stick with your original order, your permits, your applications, and all of your inspections are gonna sail through and you'll get your final PTO toot sweet. <laughs> and as you might've heard from the Tesla automotive side of the business, the best service is no service. So if you don't need Tesla to communicate with you, then your experience is gonna be awesome. <laughs> you know, in order to best set yourself up uh, for success, go with Tesla's recommended system configuration and just let the rest take care of itself. And I mean, if you do move forward with Tesla Solar, you can use my referral code to save a few hundred bucks on your order. You can go to ts.la slash Aaron62310 to place your order and it'll take you to that referral page. All right, next we've got um, an email from Rick Reed. He sends a link of an IndyStar article covering the state of Indiana's net metering. Let's read it, quote, Hi, Aaron. I uh, thought you might like to read this about net metering in Indiana. I've sent the link and cut and pasted the body of the article in this email in case you can't open it, end quote. And um, I can't open it, which is awesome. So let's pull up the article and let's read the excerpt um, uh, that I wanted to highlight here. So this is Indy Star. Let's scroll down a bit says, quote, solar power is about to become much more expensive for Hoosiers as a state policy meant to help boost the renewable energy in the state expires on July 1st. Once that deadline passes, Indiana utility customers will no longer be allowed to participate in what is called net metering when they install solar panels on their roofs. 
Without that policy, consumer advocates worry that this will mean for the future of solar and residents' ability to access it. If I could use one word, I would say uncertain, said Kerwin Olson, executive director of Consumer Advocacy Group, Citizen Action Coalition, end quote. And my immediate reaction is to point out that net, net metering is doomed anyway. So why do we care about it dying sooner rather than later? Well, obviously it's more nuanced than that. Um, and certainly we probably want to be encouraging stuff, but let's look at statistics to get a better feel for where Indiana is on the production continuum and on the solar adoption curve. So the first place I want to stop is one of my favorite places. This is Unbound Solar's um, page. Uh, it estimates solar production potential by region. Uh, this is their peak sun hours map. And you'll see that most of Indiana right here is in um, the green region or the three and a half hour. Is that right? No, sorry. 4.2 hour, 4.2 sun hour region. Uh, it's the same as where I am here in Connecticut. Connecticut happens to be up there. Um, and I'd say that's a reasonable amount of production, but we still need to see uh, what electricity rates are in Indiana to get a sense of whether solar can compete at uh, you know that production capacity because it is lower on the spectrum. So let's pull up the EIA. Um, no, we're not ready for EIA. We're going to go to Energy Sage. They have the cost of electricity in Indiana. If we scroll down a little bit, we can see that electric rates in Indiana are about 15 cents per kilowatt hour. That's half what rates are here in Connecticut. I mean, not quite, but almost. And economically, it doesn't look like it's gonna make sense to go solar, if I'm gonna be frank. Now, I'm not saying that economics are the only reason to go solar. Certainly, it might still be interesting from a sustainable energy perspective. So let's see how they generate electricity on their grid. Now it's time to go to EIA. Uh, this is the um, U.S. Energy Information Administration. We are in the Indiana part of the website, and they show how this state consumes their electricity or how they produce their electricity. I'm clicking on the production tab, and you can see it is coal miles and away above everything else. They're basically making all of the electricity by burning coal. So that's not great. Um, honestly, I'm a bit surprised that Indiana is still using basically 100% coal to power their grid. They do use some biofuels um, driven specifically by ethanol. As you know, Indiana is a, 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 an agrarian state. They provide uh, a lot of um, feedstock and uh, grains and other commodities that ilk. Uh, some of that can be converted into ethanol. And you know, from that chart, renewables are a tiny percentage of um, their production as of 2020. So based on this, I would agree that it seems definitely premature to kill net metering incentives in Indiana, especially if we as a nation are looking to become more efficient with our energy production. And I mean, straight up, it should be a way cheaper way over time to generate electricity via solar and wind than via coal. Now, all of this depends on the LCOE or the levelized cost of electricity of the coal plants currently in service. Now we've gone over this before, um, and it can get a little bit complicated. And what I want to do is try to be a little bit understanding here from the utilities perspective. I could see how they would want to protect their investment in the existing power plant to maximize its LCOE. I mean, it would be the responsible thing to do from a taxpayer's perspective, right? They paid for a plant. They should be able to use the plant to its maximum capacity for the remaining life of the plant. Now, net metering would destroy the value of that investment that taxpayers have already made into the coal power plant that uh, you know would ultimately raise the cost of electricity for the majority of rate, play, rate payers in Indiana as a result. So just to be you know even handed about it, I still agree. It makes a lot of sense to keep incentivizing solar. And you know if we can get a better idea of how um, the investment curve is going in Indiana, it might make some sense to force them into uh, solar situation by by becoming active, uh, becoming activists in the state. So it seems like it's worth looking into further. Thank you very much, Rick, for bringing this to our attention. Super, super interesting. Next up, we have John. Uh, he is upside down on his inverter. See what I did there? Let's read what he's got. Quote, they put in a new breaker box inside the garage. Uh, you'll see a roof shot from July 2021 to April 2022, and I'm going to need bird proofing. 
Uh, got PTO on May 12th, 2021. One year of service overperformed, which is nice. It means it generated more electricity than they were expecting. Uh, and they got a nice check after a year. And then the inverter stops working, end quote. Ah, <laughs> the inverter. Ah, that is what lets you use all the electricity that your solar panels are producing. So what the what? <laughs> now, first question, is this a Tesla inverter or is this a solar edge inverter? As we might know, you guys might know as uh, viewers that Tesla originally uh, came to market with their solar um, packages using the solar edge inverter. Uh, they've since moved over to their own Tesla inverter. The next question is, what are they doing about it? I mean, we'll look for an update from you. We're definitely hoping for good news. And while we wait on that update, let's take a look at some of the photos that you sent in your uh, email of your installation. A lot of these are glamour shots. We can see of the existing facility before the install. Here comes Tesla and here's the layout. We can see the house uh, faces east uh, and has most of its solar on the west. And ah, here's the answer to our question, solar edge inverters, which is probably good news for Tesla inverters. I haven't heard very much about them going down at all. Um, anyway, super bummer. Glamour shot of Tesla, glamour shot of the two batteries in the garage with the gateway over here, Tesla gateway. Another glamour shot. And then on the outside, we've got the solar edge inverter with, it might be a Wi-Fi antenna or a 4G antenna. I'm not exactly sure. Um, John, if you're watching, you can let us know what that is. Uh, we have the utility boxes out here with the utility meter. Uh, some of the solar panels leaned up and some uh, roof tiles. Those look like, um, uh, not concrete tiles, but it does, oh, I'm not even showing you guys this stuff. I need to go back to the beginning. I got all excited. Uh, so here's the outside of the house. That's the garage where the batteries are gonna go. Here comes Tesla. There's the layout with the roof. So you can see it's an east-west east -west facing house with all of their solar on the west side. And then here's the answer to our question. It's the uh, solar inverters uh, from Solar Edge. There's a Tesla Energy again. Some of the workers in the background you can see. And then here are the batteries installed with the uh, Tesla gateway right here. Another glamour shot of the batteries in the gateway. And then here's the solar edge inverter on the outside of the house with the what I believe is a 4G antenna. Again, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that could be Wi-Fi. And then there's the uh, meter. Um, I believe these are concrete shingles. So if it's a a premium roof that you've put on your house. I'm curious to know why you didn't go Tesla uh, solar roof rather than solar panels. Be super interesting to know. Um, another glamour shot of the outside utilities and the inside um, box. Some roofing uh, detail. And here's an actual uh, drone shot of the roof. So this is facing east at the top. Solar panels on the west, as I've mentioned. Looks really nice. And then this is a side profile look of the Tesla solar panels. I've got to say, they really look great. I like the bezels on the outside of the Tesla solar panels. It gives it a nice finished look. They really look great. Some production numbers from the Tesla app, and we can see tragedy hits in May. Oh, that's just painful. Painful. We're not gonna look into the utility bills yet, but here's the solar edge inverter that's got the problems. Sad trombone. And here's a beautiful production curve. So June 19th, um, just about at the solstice, right? So almost best production of the year, 55 kilowatt hours. Really beautiful production curves. And then of course, tragedy strikes where the solar edge inverter stops producing at about noon. Oh, it's just painful. Anyway, I really, really appreciate you sharing. Um, I, I wonder if Tesla might be able to do you a solid. Do you think they might be able to upgrade you from a solar edge inverter to a Tesla inverter instead? You know, it's probably that uh, solar edge has been hit by the chip shortage and they just can't come up with inverters in the first place. We know that was a struggle for Tesla. Um, you know, earlier, uh, about, I don't know, six months ago, we were seeing articles on that. And it would just be awesome if they could get you a Tesla inverter instead. 
it might be more reliable. I mean, it might be a little bit more money for you, but honestly, wouldn't it be worth it? Anyway, let us know how you work out the uh, whole inverter issue. We're cheering for you. We hope you work it out really, really soon. All right next, we've got Alan Ottens. He's got some tips on how he makes the most of his solar panels. Let's see what he's got. Below are some things that I do to increase solar energy production and decrease electricity consumption. Number one, rinse off solar panels. I rinse off my solar panels bi-monthly and immensely increases my solar production by about 5%. Two, whole house fan. I installed a quiet cool whole house fan. I quite often use this whole house fan at night and early in the morning, 100 watts, instead of my 18-year-old central AC, which is 4,000 watts. Wow. Number three, Sense Energy Monitor. I did not find the Tesla app very useful, so I purchased a Sense Energy Monitor that shows me in great detail solar production and also energy usage by each electrical device. Number four, barbecue. I frequently use my barbecue instead of heating up my house with my electric oven, which is another 5,000 watts, end quote. Now, I happen to be a lazy jerk and I will never rinse off my solar panels. I'm just not gonna do it. Aside from that, I'm 44. My body is freaking the hell out when I try to just do simple, limber, tedious things that were no problem just a few years ago. I know yoga probably is going to help the whole thing out, but straight up 5%, it's not worth bankruptcy from medical bills. <laughs> but the whole house fan, I think it's really smart. You know, it's something I'm going to consider. I mean, just airflow alone makes a space way more comfortable in heat and humidity. So that's a great suggestion. The Sense Energy Monitor, it sounds awesome. Even now, I struggle to see what items are contributing the most to my energy consumption, um, you know, just using the Tesla app. So problem is, I refer you to the aforementioned lazy jerk situation going on here, and you might see where I'm going to take that one. <laughs> Barbecue. Now, that's a great American man tradition I can get behind. And it reminds me of, uh, of Ron Swanson's Pyramid of Greatness. See the central foundation of proteins right here in the center. I would assert that all of those should be smoked or grilled. In fact, I grill or smoke reasonably often, though I use propane for that. Now, it's not exactly more environmentally friendly, right? Though I don't care so much about that, if I'm going to be honest. It does cost money to fuel, right? I got to buy the propane tanks or the, the tank refills. And I could conceivably get all of my electricity for free, or marginally for free if I were to fit within my roof's production budget. But I see your point, honestly. It's a great way to offset electricity usage and a great way to keep from heating up your home just to then have to cool it down again. So in order to stay you know, within your production budget, you can go and barbecue outside. So in spite of my laziness, the suggestions here, they're really good. Uh, let me know in the comments if any of the viewers here employ these now that Alan points them out. And as a special bonus, actually, Alan and his wife, Mary, sent on a really great cartoon. I'm going to pull that up right now. The arrival of the electric bill, oil on canvas. I mean, they look so depressed. <laughs> they should get solar, right? It'll cheer them up. I love it. Thank you very much for sending. And thank you uh, to Rashidul, to Rick, to John, Alan, all of you for your input. Let's hear from the rest of you, too. Send in your YouTube links or you can call 203-816-5150, or you can email teslapowerpodcast at gmail.com. Let's take a quick break, and when we get back, we'll get into the news. So this episode uh, will cover stories on exactly one subject, Virtual power plants, VPP for short. They've been making a lot of news recently, and all of it has been covered by Electrek. First up, we have Vermont quietly building up a substantial VPP. This article says, quote, Now the company confirmed that it's deployed over 4,000 Tesla power walls at customers' homes across the state. Uh, Green Mountain Power CEO Mari McClure said to local news WCAX, the program's been running for a few years and McClure says they're finding success. There are more than 4,000 power walls in Vermont homes. McClure also said that the fleet of home batteries saved more than $3 million again in 2021. And it's likely to be much more than that this year since it saved them nearly 
$1.5 million in just one week this summer during a heat wave, end quote. Now, the first question I have about this is what was the initial investment on this $3 million savings? So let's go to tesla.com so we can find out the price of a Powerwall these days. And the way I'm gonna do that is go into Solar Roof. I'm gonna pull up the Order Now page. We're gonna put in an address and we are gonna put in an amount, basically all the same details I put in to place my order. And we're gonna go down to this section right here and we're gonna edit, specifically Powerwall. And we can see they recommend three power walls, um, but we want the marginal difference between the recommended number and an additional power wall. So let us get the calculator up. Nice. So if I clear this out, we're gonna go 2,800 or 28,500 and we will subtract the next marginal number down. Can we still see that? Uh, 20,500. Minus 20,500. I, can I do that in my head? No. <laughs> so 8,000 bucks. All right, so I can probably do this next part in my head too, but let's put it on screen for good measure. So we're gonna multiply this $8,000 per Powerwall by the 4,000 Powerwalls um, that they had invested in, and we get $32 million as an initial investment. Now that's, that's quite an investment. I mean, I realize there were incentives involved, so it's not like the end user had to pay all of that, but uh, it was still paid, you know, the incentive was paid by the organization. Um, so the all-in investment is the same, even though it's split between the homeowner and the utility. So if we take the presumably conservative number from last year um, and divide it by the initial investment, so 32 million divided by 3 million in savings, the municipality would have needed more than 10 years to recoup the investment. I don't know. I mean, as fuel prices have been volatile, um, I, it could shorten the payback period. That is possible. Um, but if we think a couple of years down the line when oil production is up and as renewables take a larger part of the energy mix, which will then lower demand, you'll have higher production, lower demand, and that will drop prices for fuel, which will lower the overall savings, right? So it's conceivable that the savings will drop and the pay to pay the payback period would be even longer. Um, 10 years, though, I would say it's not bad. And for um, you know a conservative estimate, um, I think I can be pretty pleased with that. Um, as battery prices fall, though, that payback period is definitely going to be a lot better. Um, yeah, super interesting to think about, though. All right, next, let's head down to Texas. Uh, this article says, quote, Tesla is operating a virtual power plant demonstration in Texas to show the grid authorities the potential of such a project. Tesla wrote about the project. Your Tesla Powerwall is capable of providing powerful support to the grid. Currently, however, homes in Texas are not allowed to provide some of the critical grid supporting services that are typically provided by conventional power plants. Allowing Powerwall's clean energy to provide these services is important to creating a more resilient grid and accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy. The company says it has about 200 Powerwall owners in the ERCOT North sector in Texas that can choose to opt in the program as volunteers, end quote. And we have a more recent companion article that points out their application to become a retail energy provider in the state. Let's bring that up. And uh, if we scroll down a little bit, it says, quote, Tesla could be looking to get deeper into the Texas energy market and become a full electric retailer, which is what the company now confirms through a new job posting found by Electric. The automaker is looking for a product operations manager in the retail electricity uh, division based in Austin. End quote. And the VPP is just in its proof of concept stage. It won't be for long. So right now, nobody's going to get paid, but I guarantee you they will. 
Uh, it's part of a larger move by Tesla to become a distributed utility, as we see as we cover more of these recent VPP stories. And the next place we will head is in California. Uh, this article says, quote, the new version of the Tesla virtual power plant actually compensates Powerwall owners $2 per kilowatt hour that they contribute to the grid during emergency load reduction events. That actually happens to be the marginal amount they they contribute. So what above and beyond what they normally contribute. Homeowners are expected to get between $10 and $60 per event, end quote. And you remember, this also started as a volunteer proof of concept program. It's now paying owners for their electricity on top of the savings that uh, owners get from owning the product and offsetting uh, peak electricity rates. Um, they're also providing peak capacity in lieu of more expensive fossil fuel peak uh, uh, peaker plants. Um, and of course, we have a companion article for this one as well. Uh, this is for, again, the California VPP. If we scroll down a bit, it says, quote, during the last two weeks since the first event, Tesla's virtual power plant in California has grown significantly. Last bulb is tracking the growth of the network and noted that it just reached 3,500 homes and a capacity of 50 megawatt hours, end quote. And we have a couple of charts showing the uh, performance of the system. I encourage you to go to the article and check that out. Now, California is really struggling through the transition to renewables, and this program is already making a positive difference. We just need more battery capacity. And there's a lot of positive movement here. The VPP is the consumer's contribution. That's our contribution, you and me, to this transition. And the more of us that join, the better. Next, let's head to Japan. They unveil a new power plant in Japan. Um, they're using uh, Powerwall home battery packs. And this time it's on an island, Miyakojima in Japan. It continues. Tesla announced that it started to install Powerwalls in partnership with the local electric utility in 2021. And it now has over 300 Powerwalls on the island as part of the VPP. And quote, and this is added to a growing list of VPPs around the world. I found this list of the largest ones. Let's pull this up, super interesting. Um, this is from Prospero. And you can see number one, the very biggest is Tesla in Australia. Obviously that's all Tesla Powerwalls. Next we have Stadtkraft. This is in a uh, Norwegian company uh, that operates in Europe. Uh, it's not clear if they're using any Tesla Powerwall products, although they probably are. It just isn't featured and it's probably not the majority. We also have Next Kraftwerke. This is in Germany. That's probably gonna be mostly Sonnen energy, but the next one, AGL, this is again in Australia and it uses a lot of Tesla Powerwalls. Um, it's one of several vendors though, of course. Now you might remember there's also Octopus Energy in the UK, they're using Powerwalls. There's Swell Energy in New York State also using Powerwalls. So there's a lot going on and Tesla is leading the way. And that makes it official, right? Tesla is a worldwide utility and it's growing. We've just seen the beginning of Tesla's process of scaling all of this up. And we're gonna be hearing a lot more of these stories over the coming months. And in just a couple of years, this is gonna be a huge business. And you and I are part of it, which is pretty cool. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, let's watch the featured video. And today we have a quick clip with a VPP overview. Uh, we have The Verge Science. They cover a lot of pop science topics and they have a nice retro SimCity look at virtual power plants and how they work. But as more and more solar owners install batteries, new opportunities open up. All those batteries are little reservoirs of power. And if they all work together, they could become a power plant just like the one at Shoreham. This gets pretty abstract, so we're going to visualize it with some retro help. A copy of SimCity 2000, the classic city building game. So first we plan our little town. You need some land for industrial and commercial and residential. Then you add utilities, plumbing. This actually becomes kind of a chore. And then we bring it to life. 
Okay, so we're gonna start with these three little neighborhoods all in a row. This coal-fired plant here is our baseload power. It's the default power source for our city. The three neighborhoods are the same, except for one variable. The first one has no solar at all. It relies on the coal plant for all of its power. In this one, some homeowners have rooftop solar for their own use, and maybe a few have batteries as well. And yes, we added the solar panels in post because this game came out in 1993. Neighborhood number three is the fanciest. Each building is wired up with solar plus a battery. All the systems are networked together, and a portion of the power in each battery is usable by the power company. So say I'm doing some landscaping over by my power lines, and whoops. There's a service interruption between the power plant and the neighborhoods. What happens now? Well, neighborhood one loses power immediately. Say goodbye to all the food in the fridge. Neighborhood two is patchy. The homes with solar and batteries are okay for now, but everyone else is out of luck. And neighborhood three has power because every building has a backup battery, but there's more energy in those batteries than the neighborhood needs. And thanks to the networking, the utility can pull power from lots of those batteries all at once. Neighborhood three has become a virtual power plant and can restore power to all of the other homes until the lines from the coal plant are restored. And I like those visuals. It goes on to point out that this same concept can be used to retire peaker plants when energy use outstrips the base load provided by the utility. Of course, one day we will be able to replace base load with batteries, but I don't know, we might be, we might be decades away from that. And the source of electricity, it doesn't have to be solar panels, of course. Uh, this is what they use in the example, and that's what we mostly think of. But, um, you know, it's the batteries that are doing all the heavy lifting in these scenarios. It's not the electricity source, right? Because it's interrupted. It's storage that's the key distributed battery storage specifically. That is what's gonna make our grids more resilient and allow the adoption of more intermittent resources of, elect uh, sorry, sources of electricity like renewables. So solar, wind, and whatnot. And where are we gonna go uh, um, to get enough batteries to make this happen? Well, we're not sure yet, but we'll talk about more in the next podcast. For now, let's talk about um, my experience, a quick note on production and PTO. And if I start streaming on my phone, we can take a look at um, what uh, production has been like in the last um, few days, weeks. Hasn't been great, if I'm gonna be honest. Of course, we're getting into shorter days and that's gonna have a pretty big impact on um, production. Uh, today, of course, we've produced nothing. It's just after midnight. So we, we're just getting started on quote today, but. Yesterday, uh, we've only generated, you know, not even 30 kilowatt hours, which is pretty low. Um, the car can take more than that sometimes, depending. Well, generally it'd be about 10 kilowatt kilowatts, but that gets into efficiency loss and all that kind of stuff, which uh, we'll talk about in another episode. Um, these are decent days. We're getting close to 50 kilowatt hours. That's a beautiful production curve. But uh, we can compare that to my brother-in-law's system. Uh, you can see that he's been generating basically 60 kilowatt hours a day. Uh, a couple of low production days, but that's because we've had some rain, a lot of um, cloud cover. And then if we compare month on month numbers, uh, he's produced 540 kilowatt hours this month with his traditional solar array. And with my Tesla solar roof, I've generated uh, 483. So I'm trailing his production pretty significantly. Now, uh, talking PTO, uh, it still eludes me. I mean, I've sent another follow-up email to see where we are and I'll report when I have something significant to, to share. And that'll do it for episode 63 of the Tesla power podcast. Please use my referral code. If you're going to buy solar from Tesla, you can get a solar roof or solar panels and, uh, a $300 um, uh, credit on your order for either one of those. To get to that order page, you'll navigate to ts.la slash Aaron62310 to place your order. I'm Aaron Brady. I'm your Tesla residential energy community organizer. Let's do this again on the next video.